Second. Okay, so we are holding on uh, the second day. Today's Monday, chapter 31, verse number 18. This is a long parsha. Um, this is, a, we put the whole portion of the story of the eagle in the reading of Levi, in the leading of Levi, because the Levis did not sin in the golden calf. So not to embarrass the Jewish people, majority of Pasha is in this reading, in today's reading in Monday. Verse number 18. And when he was finished speaking, we're going all the way back to going up to Mount Sinai. When he's finished speaking, to speaking to Mount Sinai, he gave us to gave him two uh, gold, two tablets of testimony. Suvim Be'etzvalakim, they were written in this, they were written by the finger of God. So Rashi says, There's no chronological order in the title. The episode of the, of the calf took place long before the command, the work of the Mishkan. For on the 17th of Thomas, the tablets are broken. I am Kippur, the Holy One, blessed be he, he was reconciled with Israel. On the matter of the 11th of Tishrei, they commenced with the donations of the Mishkan, and the Mishkan was erected on the 1st of Nisan. So, the Rashi says that the whole Pashas Truma, the Tzava, is all happened after this story. So there's no chronological order in the Torah. And there's no actual machlekes, the argument, when was the command of the giving of the building of the Mishkan? Was it before the was it before the, uh, the the story, after the story? It was surely built after the story. So uh, the story, uh, went, went up to the mountain. Um, he came down to the 17th day of Tammuz. He broke the Luchas. This whole story happened on the 17th day of Tammuz. He went back up 40 days to beg by God. And then uh, they went back up another 40 days. And on Yud Tishrei, he came down to beg to, I mean, he came down a third time with the second Luchas, Yom Kippur, Yud Tishrei. And that's when God said, I forgive you. And then on the next day, they started to do the Beis the Mishkan from Tishrei, from the 11th of Tishrei, and the Beis Amigda, the Mishkan and the tabernacle was standing on the Yishchidosh Nisan of that year. Actually, the Beis Amigda, the Mishkan was finished on Kislev, on the 25th day of Kislev. That's it. So they built it from Tishrei, from the 11th of Tishrei, to the end of Tishrei, Cheshven, to the, two months took him to actually put together the Beis Amidosh, the Mishkan. But God said to hold off until Nisan. And there's, and started the Shredish Nisan. So, um, Right, so the Abish said one day will one day will come and the 25th day of Kisa will be also a celebration of dedication to Mishkan, which happened in the story of the Maccabees. Kalaisa is this word is missing, is spelled with missing a, a vav in the, after the Lamed. Spelled effectively without a vav, as is Kalaisa, meaning like his bride. For the trainer was delivered to him, Moses, as a gift. As a bride is given to the bridegroom, because otherwise he could not have learned it at all in such a short, short time. So it was like a gift. Abish gave him the gift, the whole tater. Another explanation: just like a bride is adorned with twenty-four ornaments, the one listed in, book, in the book of Isaiah, so too must a tater be be adorned with twenty-four books of the Scripture. And possesses knowledge of entire scripture. If you want to really be a Tamachacham, you have to be Baki Taylor. You know the whole title. The Dabirite, he finished speaking to him, Chukim, Mishpatim, Shabbat. What was Mesh Rabbein doing there for 40 days? The Dabirite, Mesh Shemeya Piagbura, this teaches us that Mesh Rabbein heard the title from God. And then they did Chazara, repeat. They would both repeat the halacha together. So Moshe Rabbeinu for 40 days had the best chaver, the best colleague. He sat and learned with God the whole Torah. 
and they explained each other and they had learned with each other and they uh, spoke with each other. So again, the luchos over here is this thing of vav. And it comes to tell us they were exactly the same size. Chapter 32, verse number one. And the people saw the Mesha was late. Now we know they were not Chabadniks because you're never late at Chabad. So they were late. They were late. He was late. Mesha Beno was late. The man by Jews, he was, he was late. And so the people gather around Aaron and Vayim, and they said to him, Moshe Ben is dead. Let us make a God. will go before us. Because this Moshe, the man, the time it took us out of the land of Egypt. We don't know what happened to him. As she says, Moshe's is an interesting word. The Tagum is an expression of lateness. Like that, do so what happened over here? He waited until late. When Moshe went up to the mountain, he said, he said to the Jews, at the end of 40 days, I will come, come within six hours from the sunrise of the 40th day. They thought that the day he went up is included in the number of 40 days. But in fact, he said that in 40 days, again, by Jews, if the, day, the, the day doesn't go with the, the night. The, the day follows the night. So if he went up by day, that he started to count his 40 days from the night. So the day that he went up by Moshe, and he was not counted. And that was their mistake. He really should have gone up at night. And then they would have counted the 40 days right. But he went up by day. And the 40 days later, they calculated it was from the day. And it was wrong. They, were, they needed another day. So that's the meaning of the fact. They, they thought that he went up, including the number of 40 days. In fact, he said to them 40 days, meaning complete days, including the night. But the day he descended, not of this night, including with it, because he went up during the day, because Moshe ascended in the morning. For on the seventh of Sivan, he ascended to the mountain. Thus, on the 40, the 40th day Moshe ascended was the 17th day of Thomas. So that's why when Moshe Rabbeinu came down on the 17th day of Thomas, it was the right day. On the 16th of Thomas, the Sultan came and brought a confusion in the world and showed a semblance of darkness, even with pitch darkness and confusion, as indicated that Moshe had surely died. And therefore, confusion had come upon the world. So he, the Sultan, said to them, Moshe has died for six additional hours already passed, right? Because he already came, it came at night and he was not there. In Akum, has found the track of the Shabbos. You cannot say that the Israelites were aired only on a cloudy day. They were confused between before noon and afternoon because Moshe Rabbein did not ascend until the next day. Moshe Rabbein came the next day. So they were not confused in a couple hours. They were confused in a whole day. So it's, as it says, on the next day, they arose early and burnt off. Moshe Rabbein came next. So they thought he's going to come on the 16th of the month of Thomas, because that was the 40th day where they calculated when he went up the mountain. But Moshe Rabbeinu meant the next day, because the day he went up was not counted, because it didn't come with the night. So the day started on, this, on, the, on, on the seventh at night, which is the eight of, eight, eight of Sivan, which automatically the 17th day of Thomas is the day that he was supposed to come down. So here we see that they were not, they, were, they used out this whole thing to create a confusion by Jews. That is, maybe we need to have go back to, to the pagan ways or whatever the ways they had those days, and we'll have uh, many gods. The Gemara says that a, the Sultan showed them something assembling Moshe being carried in the air, Hi, so carried on a bed, he's like dead. We need Moshe Rabbeinu. He directed us in the way we should go. Once we lost Moshe Rabbeinu, now we need God.
you know what? Remove your golden earrings that are on your ears of your wives. For your sons and your daughters. Bring me all the gold that your wives are wearing. And as she says, the iron setters of the women and children who were fond of the jewelry. Perhaps the matter will be a little late. The wife's going to say, well, I'm not giving you my jewelry. I don't give you back my, my jewelry. In the meantime, my shul arrived. The problem is the Jews did not wait. The men did not wait. As it says, they took their own jewelry. Because the wife's taka told them, go blow. We're not, they were not taking, we're not giving you the blue jewelry. Parkulash and tzivui. Parkul remove an impression of expression of a command. So all these guys took off the gold that was in their own ear and their own ears. He didn't wait. Adam was trying to procrastinate. They didn't procrastinate. Ten minutes later, they had all the gold in front of him. By Isparkud, she says, it stripped themselves off. It sounds like an expression of unloading the burden. When they removed them earrings for the air, they were like found and unlo- uh, to be unloaded of the ear- earrings. So it's like an expression that they spoke and they said, wow, we're gonna, we're gonna, we're, we're getting rid of this whole situation. We got the Torah, but we're, get, we're like they expressed themselves of freedom that we're gonna get rid of this whole situation. They're gonna change the whole Yiddishkeit. We're gonna change the whole Yiddishkeit. We're gonna throw the burden of the Torah. This happened many times in history. We do whatever. We're going to get rid of this, uh, this whole situation where I don't have to have these obligations anymore. It's Nizme, similar when they leave the city. So he took it from their hands, all this gold. And he fashioned it in an engraving tool. And it made, and made it into a molten calf. Ayemiru, and they said, Eila lekecha Yisrael. And they said, This is the God of Israel. Asher Elohim and Zion, this is the God of Israel who took us out of the Zion. Oi, oi, oi. So Rashi says, How is this possible? What's going on over here? Rashi says, It's very interesting words over here. You have to listen to the words in the title. It's very fascinating words. By Yotza, Bachoret, Oisa Bachoret, this clause can be rendered in two ways. One is vayotza, an expression of time, and bachot is an expression of may, meaning a kerchief, simply a tablecloth. He tied two talents of silver in a purse. Second way rendering that the vayotza is an expression of meaning of form, bachot is a tool. Not clear exactly with which they cut and engrave forms of gold. The tool is like a scribble style, which engraves letters on a tablet. This second interpretation is what Unkelis renders with Tsar Yosef Zifa, expression of Zif, a tool which people engrave letters designs, such as known in French as Nilia, Nila work. So Kevin, so what, what happened over here? Because it, make, it, says, it says he fashioned with an engraving tool and made into a molten into, into a molten calf. So now she says, a molten, as soon as they cast, as soon as they had cast it into the fire, the sorcerers of the mixed multitude who had gone up with them for Egypt came and made it with sorcery. Others say, Micha was there, Micha, who emerged from the layer of a building when he was crushed in Egypt. Micha was a child, the Gemara says, who was put into a building. The Pharaoh put him as cement in a building. And Moses saved him. And he became, in, in, in Egypt, like Moshe Rabbeinu's uh, little boy. And he ran around with him wherever he went. And when Moshe Rabbeinu took, got Moses's Yosef, Yosef was buried in the Nile. So Moshe Rabbeinu couldn't find, couldn't get out the Nile. He couldn't get the, 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 his sarcophagus, what do they call the, 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 the uh, his tomb that was in the Nile. So Moshe Rabbeinu wrote on a plate, Alei Shur, Alei Shur. 
a sendo ox, a sendo ox, because Yosef was called an ox. And he threw it into the Nile. And the and Yosef came up. This kid, Micha, took this plate. He had in hand this plate, which was inscribed by ascend, ascend ox, or sendo ox, to miraculously bring Yosef Kaffer into the Nile. So he took the Micha, took this, 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 this plate, and he threw it into the molten fire. And this calf came out. Molten matzecha expression related to matzechas, both metal, both of dry from the root, meaning to pour. Another interpretation 125 centimeters of gold were in it. Gematria masecha. 125 talents of gold. It's a big calf. Eila lekecha. He doesn't say this is our God. But here we learn that the mixed motor that had come up to Egypt were in ones who gathered against Adam. And they were ones who made it, the calf. Afterwards, they caused the Idola to stray after it. So this was the um, group of, of non-Jews, the Egyptians that went out with the, with, with the Jews. And there was 3,000 of them. And they basically decided to, uh, to create this havoc. But the problem is the Jews followed them. That was a sadness. Aaron saw what happened, and he built, and we'll soon see what that means, and he built a mezbeach before it. And Aaron said, Tomorrow shall be a festival for the Lord. What did Aaron see? The Aaron saw that this calf was living. This calf was walking around. As it says in Tilim, he saw like a likeness of an ox eating grass. And he saw the Satna work was succeeding. He had no words to stall them completely. Because he saw this thing is this thing is it has more than life. By even his best, he said, "You know what? Let's build an altar. I'm going to build an altar. It's going to take me time. Um, and we're going to make over here tomorrow. We'll wait till tomorrow, and tomorrow we'll make a celebration." By so she says, "But it will not be today. Perhaps Moshe would come before they worship." This is a simple meaning. In the Medish meaning, in Leviticus Rabbah, Aaron saw many things. He saw his sister's son, Chor, who had repro reproved them, and they assassinated him. They killed Chor. That is the meaning by Yiv, an expression of being understanding. Mizbeach Hashem should be understood that it's written by Yiv, Mizbeach Lafana, meaning he understood from the slaughtered one in front of him. Moreover, he saw the situation that better I should be blamed than they. He also saw another thing, as it says, if you build an altar themselves, one will bring a pebble, one will bring more stones. Thus, the work will be done at once. Since I will build it, I will neglect my work. And in the meantime, Moshe Rabbeinu will arrive. Chag Hashem, here we see, Be'liboi hoyol here we see that Aaron was not trying to build an altar for this calf. Because he said, Chag Hashem, it's going to be a celebration to God. So in his heart, he meant for heaven. He was confident that Moshe would come and they will all do tshuva. They will all repent and they'll all see the faults and the wrongs what they're doing. But what happened was the first time the Jews woke up early. They all woke up the next morning early, very early. They decided to all wake up at the sunrise. And they brought, they, they brought sacrifices by Yeshua and they brought offerings by And then the people sat down and they were married, they were eating and drinking. And they and they stood up to be merry. Rashi said, Yashkim HaShatim Zedidim, did the Satan arouse them, woke them up early, get up early, it's a celebration. 
Tzachik, in this word, uh, many connotations, and, and usually it means also immorality. Tzachik being everything ultimately evil always mixes in sexuality and every kind of a negative and every kind of a, these kind of situations. And also Tzachik is also, Tzachik is laughter, murder, murder, and they killed Chor, one guy was killed. And they started to have relationships in front of this uh, in front of this calf. Then so suddenly God turned to Moshe. He told him, you better go down fast. So what means Lechreid, as she interpreted it. Amcha, for your people. That you, as Elisa may say, because your people they are brought up in the land of Egypt acted corruptly. A double of Shinkashi is an expression of harshness. Lechleid, descend from your high position. I gave you this high position for their own sake. At that time, Meshlam is banished by the decree of heaven. Thrown out. Do not say the people have acted corruptly, but your people. And those are the mixed multitude whom you accepted on your own initiative. Nobody asked you to take along these Egyptians. You took them along, to whom you converted without consulting me. You said it's good that converts cleave to the Shechina. They have accepted, they have acted corruptly, and you have corrupted others. They are, and they have and they have corrupted others. So basically, this is before Martin Tata, you shouldn't have accepted these Egyptians to come with you. you. Should have waited till after the Torah was given, where we have the laws of conversion, and we would have they would have converted according to the way it should have been. But nobody, you you took these Egyptians, you were so good hearted, they said they want to come part of the Jews. You took them without my, without doing it correctly. But ultimately, the Jews followed. They have quickly turned away from the path that I have commanded them. They made to them a molten calf. They're bowing down to it. They sacrificed to it. They said, This is the God of Israel. So God said to Moshe, I've seen these people. Being an amksha air for the stick neck people. Shail Marzidin Kesha Arfayam Nagad Machicha. They turned the hardness of the back of their necks to those who reproved them, and they refused to listen. Now leave me alone. And let my anger be kindled against them, and I will annihilate them. And I'll make you into a great nation. It's unclear why God's saying this, which implies that Moshe had made a demand. With me, let me alone. With the Moshe Rabbeinu didn't let God alone. You have not yet heard that Moshe prayed for them. And yet God says, leave me alone. But there, right here, he opened the door. God gave an opening to Moshe. That's why the next word, you'll see next passage. For him to inform him that the matter indeed depended upon him. That if Moshe would pray for them, God would not destroy them. Therefore, God implores Moshe to leave him alone so he can destroy Israel. So Moshe pleaded before God, why God? Why are you angry against your nation? Which you took out of the land of Egypt, with a strong hand, with, strong, with, with great power, with a strong hand. Now she says, is anyone jealous of another except a wise man of a wise man or a strong man of a strong man? What are you getting angry at a weak people? 
Why should the Egyptians say, If you remember, learned the Rasha, Pharaoh said, I see that there's death in, in the Gedera. There's a, there's, there's a, a, a star of death in, 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 it's coming out to you in the desert. To annihilate them in the mountain. Kill them in the mountain. To erase them, annihilate them from the face of the earth. Retreat from your heat of your anger. And we consider the evil intended of your people. Now she says, formulate another thought to do good to them. <laughs> she was giving, Meshav Beda was giving God. You should stop having evil thoughts. <laughs> you should think something else. The thought that you thought of them. Remember Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. That you made a vow to them. You spoke about them. I will multiply your seed. As the stars of the heaven. In this whole land which I spoke about. Are you going to give it to your, to your, to your children? They'll, they'll have a possession forever. And now you're basically destroying all of them. You're going against your promise. Now she says, remember, Abram, if you argue that, that they have transgressed the Ten Commandments, let me remind you that their forefather, Abraham was tested by ten tests and yet not received his reward. Gives this reward to Abraham, to him, Abraham, so that the 10 will cancel the 10. Wow. Abraham, Isaac, and Israel. If they're condemned to be burnt in fire, remember Abraham, who gave himself to over to be burnt in your sake. If they're condemned to be killed by the sword, remember Isaac, who stretched out his neck when he was bound. If they are condemned to exile, remember Jacob, who was exiled to Kharim. If the children of Israel will not be saved in their merit, why do you say to me, and I'll make you a great nation? If a chair with three legs cannot stand up before you when you get angry, how much more is a, is a chair of one leg? So if you're going if you, uh, if to make a great nation for me, for one person, here this nation is from three great people. So if you're not going to remember three great people, how are you going to remember one great person? You did not swear to them by something finite, not by the heavens and not by the earth, not by the mountains, not by the hills, but in your very self, you made a vow in your name. For you, for you exist and your oath exists forever. So you cannot break your oath. And it says to Abram, by myself I have sworn, says the Lord. To Isaac he said, and I will establish an oath that I swore to Abram your father. To Jacob he said, I am the almighty God, be fruitful and multiply. Here he swore to him, Jacob, by the name of the almighty God. So, so God says, Moshe Rabbeinu says to God, you made an everlasting vow. Can't break this everlasting vow. Verse 14, the God, the rescinded the evil. Which he swore, which he said he would do to his nation. He turned and he came down the mountain. The two tablets, the Yoda in his hands. This was, this was a, a tablet so written on both sides. The letters went through both sides, and you could read the you could read the letters on both sides. As Rashi says, the letters could be read. This was a miraculous phenomenon. In the luchas tablets were made by God. He carved out these tablets. In the in the Abishter, God Himself wrote the words on the tablets. Kuchoras al luk was engraved on the tablets. Now she says this interpretation according to the parent meaning. That he personally made them. Another interpretation, like a person who says to his friends, 
all so and so activities are in such and such a work. So too, the delight of the of the Holy One, blessed be, is with the Torah. God said, "That's where I have my delight. That's where I'm chorus. That's where I'm engraved. I'm engraved on this on the Torah." Chorus. The term chorus, chorot, are one, the same. Both are expression of engraving. On the bottom of the mountain, as Moshe came down the mountain, there was one person there, and that was Yeshua. By Yishma Yeshua's Kailam Bara. Yeshua was not the Yeshua was still on the bottom of the mountain. He never moved. He stayed on the bottom of the mountain. And as Moshe Rabbeinu came down, he also heard a commotion happening in, in, in the camp. He said to Moshe Rabbeinu, you know, don't we hear a voice of war? It sounds like there's some kind of a war going on in, 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 in the middle of the, the guy, you know, what's happening there. But Ra, as she says, in their shouting, for they both, they were shouting, rejoicing and laughing. The Jews were so loud, they could be heard even from a distance. By Yemes, but Moshe Rabbeinu knew already what it was. By Yemes, so Moshe said, I don't, need, I don't hear a voice of victory. Neither do I hear a voice of defeat. I hear a voice of blasphemy. A voice of blasphemy I hear. Now she says, this voice does not appear to be a voice of shouting heroes crying victory, nor a voice of weak with Jews crying, whoa, we are, we have to, we are in danger. I hear a curl of noise, a voice of blasphemy and reveling, which, dis which distresses the soul of the one who hears them when they are set in. Verse 19, when they came to close to the, to the camp, and they saw, when saw this calf, and the dances, Moshe got angry, he threw the luchas down from his hands, and he shattered them at the foot of the mountain. He, when he flung, Rashi says, he said to himself, if in regard to the Passover sacrifice, which is merely one of the commandments, the Torah says, no estranged may be taken it. Now that the entire Torah is in, Ten Commandments, including the whole Torah, and all Israelites are apostates, they're all basically goyim. Shall I give it to them? They're all basically doing our way desire. Worshipping idols, heretics. Threw it down. to the bottom of the mountain. Came down the mountain of Yikah to eagerly took this calf. I should also do they made by Yisra Beish. These Moshe Rabbeinu's leadership. They were all reveling. He just walked right into the situation, took the calf, he burnt it, threw it into a fire. And he turned it into to fine, grinded it into fine flour. And he threw it into water. And they told him, you should all drink this water. So he scattered, expression of scattering, similar brimstone shall be scattered. He intended to test them. Like later on, we have a woman who was a woman who, who maybe had a, he didn't know who, he didn't know who, uh, who sinned and who didn't sin. So it was like a woman, a Saita, who suspected an adultery. Three different death penalties were married out here. And one, if there were witnesses to the worship and warning had been issued to the sinner, they were punished by the sword, as was from see. According to the law, that applies to people in the city who has been astray are many. Those who practice knives with, 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 with witnesses, but without a warning, died from the plague. Because it says, then the Lord struck the people of the plague. Those who practice idolatry, both without witness and without warning, died from dropsy, for the water 
tested them and their stomach swelled up. This was a very tragic situation. What did these people do to you? Which you brought upon a great sin. And she says, how many tortures did you, Aaron, endure? That they tortured you until you brought the sin upon them. Aaron said, let my Lord anger grow. Let not my Lord anger grow hot. You know these people are disposed towards evil. They're always going to, to the bad direction, testing God. And they said to me, I say, They said to me, let me go, God. I shall go before us. This Moshe, the man who was taken out of Egypt, we do not know what happened to him. I told him, whoever has, whoever has gold, spoke, he told give it to me. And here we see that that's exactly what happened. I said before, I took it, I threw it into the fire, and the eagle came out. Because I don't know, it was not a carpenter. I told him, I, I told him one word, who has gold? I have to give it to you. I never said in the word to give me gold. I said, who has gold? And a second later, they gave it to me. I took this gold, I threw it into a fire. I don't know, it'll take some time. We're going to have to get a carpenter. We'll, get a, get a, we'll have to get people to figure out what to make. I mean, how do you know that they're going to make an eagle? Who knows what their mind was? They didn't say what, the, what kind of God, what kind of image they want to make. Why didn't they make a different image? What happened was, I threw it into the fire, and the eagle came walking out. And Moshe saw that they were exposed. For Aaron had exposed them to be disgraced before their adversaries. So they were uncovered. Disgrace was revealed. The That this thing should be, be disgraced for them in the mouth of those who rise up against them. And we know that the everything, all every old sodas come from this story, the ego. And Moshe Ben stood at the gate of the camp. And he said, Mi la shem Whoever is to the for the God, let him come to me. By Sifal of Kobane Levi and all the sons of Levi gathered around him. Mi la shem elai Kobane Levi. So all the sons of Levi from here, we learned that the entire tribe was righteous. And he said to them, This is what God says. Each man shall place his sword on his thigh. Go from gate to gate. And let every man kill his brother. And every man is friend with the ish as craving man. Wow. Koyam Arashen, where did the Abish tell him this? The Veach Lalakim Yechem. He who slaughters a sacrifice to God shall be destroyed. This is what it says in Shemais chapter 22, verse 9. How is a Pasha a Levi to have a brother that sinned? No, I thought all Levis did not sin. For, from his mother, who was an ordinary Israelite and not a Levite. He had a brother. His mother got remarried, married to a regular Jew. Now his, his stepbrother is a regular Jew. And that's exactly what the tribe of Levi did. And they killed, on that day, they killed 3,000 people, 3,000 men. So those are the 3,000 people that sinned with witnesses and warning. 
these were the main guys. said, Initiate yourself today for the Lord. Each man is a son and his brother. So that he may bestow a blessing upon you. You who have killed them, with this thing you act and initiate yourself to be servants to God. Ki ish. Amongst you, you initiate himself through his son and through his brother. It was the next day, and God, Moshe Rabbeinu, turned to the people and said to them, You did a great sin, and uh, you did something totally the opposite of the Ten Commandments. I'll go up to God, maybe he'll forgive you. This means I will place a cleansing, a wiping away, a barrier opposite your sin to separate you from your sin. And Moshe went up the mountain again. He said to God, please, people created a great sin. And they made a God of gold. God knows that. So now she says, Moshe Rabbein is saying to God, it was you. <laughs> Moshe Rabbein said, it's your fault. You caused them to sin. For you lavished upon them gold. Whatever they desired. They came out of Egypt with 90 donkeys of gold or so. What are they going to do with all this gold? What should they have done with all this? Do this if not to sin. This may be illustrated in the parable of a king who gave his son to eat and drink, dressed him up, Hung him on a coin purse with his neck and stationed at the brothel. Told him, don't go sin. What do you expect him not to sin? You brought it upon the people. And this is a famous statement of Mesha. Now, if you forgive them, good. If you're not going to forgive the Jewish people, I want you to erase me from this book. Rashi says, That's good. I will not ask you to erase me. But if not, erase me. This is this verse, and there are many like it. It's very hard to, there's a lot of interpretations on this passage. From the entire Torah, so that they will not say to me about me, they will, I won't be known as a, as, a, as a leader who did not help his people. And, and therefore, if you're not to forgive them, you need, David said to begin with, I will make you the nation. And here, Moshe Ben says the opposite. He tells the God, if you're not going to forgive the Jewish people, erase me from the book. Those who sin to me, I will erase from the book. Oh, so this pastor needs a lot of interpretation. Exactly what is the answer that Moshe Abedu got? Now go, lead the people. Here we see that the, the, the Abishtu wanted to banish Moshe Rabbeinu and the Jews they wanted, didn't want to have any, any presence of his, of, of his existence with them. And that's why uh, Moshe Rabbeinu came up with the Mishkan because that would, that would, uh, create, that would bring God you know, to the, uh, to, to the Eden. Excuse me. And Ubiyayim Pakati Pakalat Chattasim but the day I'll make accounting to the sins upon them, I'll bring their sins account against them. That's, that is really the toughness of this situation. That's truly the toughness of this situation. Because the Tzadis, it's brought down the Gemara, the Tzadis of Yidin throughout history is because of this thing. Every time this story comes before God, to remind God of the sin of the golden calf. The will find using the word dibber, speech, instead of a lie, similar to speak to him. 
Hinimalachi, he is my angel and not me. Now I have listened to you, not to destroy them at once, but always, always, when I take counting of their sins, I will also count a little of this sin with other sins. This means no punishment befalls Israel in which there is not a part of the punishment of the golden calf. We need to rectify the punishment of the golden calf. By Yigav Hashem and then the Lord struck the people with a negative, with a with a uh, a plague. Asha also say eagle that they did the eagle. Asha also Aaron, which Aaron made. Now she says this was the second one. This was the misa with the shemaim, the death in heaven that happened to people that sinned without witnesses or without a warning. I'm sorry, with witnesses and without a word. Chapter 33, verse number one. God said to Go ascend from here. You and the people have taken out of Mitzrayim. Go and uh, go up with them to the land. Let them continue the journey. We're still not going to, we're not going to, we're not going to Shalom, forget the promise I made to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and let them go to Eretz Yisrael, and we will start again. So now she says the land of Israel is higher than all lands. That's why I said another explanation. This is the contrast to what to him, Moshe, in the time of Aaron, go descend. God says now, Lechale, go, go ascend. So you see, every down, every downer is for an upper. God said two minutes ago to him, whatever, a couple of days to him to ascend. And now he says to us, descend. Now he tells him to ascend. It's out of on you and the, and the people. It says you and the people. It doesn't say you and your and your people. Amchad. Abraham changes the um to Amchad. Amchad to, 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 the, to the people. And I will send an angel before you. The Gerashti will chase away the Saknani, the Canaanites, with Amori, the Amorites, Vachiti, Aprizi, Achizi, Ayusi. The Gerashti says, These are the six nations, listen here. Although the seven nations are, were mentioned, and this is because the Gishavit, the Gish, the, the, the uh, Gerashi, got up and immigrated because, because of them. On their own accord, they ran away. So one of the seven nations ran away. I'll bring you to a land of milk and honey. It's flowing milk and honey. I will not go in your midst. Because this is a stubborn neck nation. At least I destroy them on the way. So now she says, I tell you, take them. Take them up. I will not go in their midst. Therefore, I'm telling you, I'll send it, I'll send, I'll send with you an angel. And when the Shekhinah is in your midst and you rebel against him, I will increase my fear against you. Therefore, it's the best thing I don't travel with you. And the and the people heard this. This was a terrible decree, and the Abish is not going to go. But it's Ablu, and they mourned, and they did not put on their finery. That the Shekhinah would not rest upon them or go with them. The Jewish people, the Gemara said, were given crowns at Mount Sinai. When they said Nasev and Ishma, they were given two crowns of glory. And they lost their crowns of glory. Tell the Jewish people, mourning is not going to help anything. You are stubborn people. You and I should go in your midst in one minute. I'll destroy you. So that's, I'm not going with you. Because not because <laughs> I want to protect you. So you're good. I want to protect you. He took your finery, he took your, your adem, he took your crowns off you. And I will know what to do with you. 
If you go in your midst for one moment, I will destroy you. If I go up into your midst on you and you rebel against me with your stubbornness again, I'll be furious with you in one moment, which is the measure of my wrath. It says, hide for one moment until the wrath passes. I will destroy you. Therefore, it's better for you that I send an angel. But now this punishment you will suffer immediately and you'll take off your finery. And I will know what to do with you in the visitation of the rest of sins. I know what my heart to do with you. It's not so when they saw Sedim Achedev and the Jewish people divest themselves of the fineries of Mount Chedev. For the fineries, as I said, the Gemara explains the two glory, the crowns of glory of Nasa and Nishim. Moshe also took his tent, but not only Machutzlamachan. He moved out of the camp. Very far away from the camp. And he called it the tent of meeting. Whoever was in search for God would go out to that tent. Which was out of the camp. Moshe, from that moment of the sin, he moved out. This is an expression of present tense, meaning that he would take his tent and pitch it outside the camp. He said, one who is banished from his master is banished from this disciple. How far was 2,000 cubits? He moved out 2,000 cubits. The Karalite, and he would call it a tent of meeting, that is the meeting house of those who seek God. For here we deduce those who seek the presence of a sage is tantamount to those who seek the presence of God. Yetzel, let her go out. Yetzel would go out. Another interpretation, how she says, and it will be that anyone seeking the Lord, even the ministering angels, when they're asked the place of the Shechina, they would say, where is the presence of God? The presence of God is in Moses' tent. Or you could say, whenever Moshe Rabbeinu left the tent, Yakuma Kalam, all the nation would stand. The Nitzvah Pesach Oil, and they would all stand at the entrance of their tents. And they would watch him until he came into his tent. It's a present tent of the camp to go to the tent. Yakuma Kalam, and they would stand before him, not sit down until he concealed from them. The Bita Chemeshin admiration they would say, Fortune is a woman, fortune one born of a woman who has assured by God that the Shechina follows him to the entrance of the tent. When Moshe Rabbeinu came to his tent, he aided a mudan and a cloud, a pillar of cloud would descend and stand over the entrance of the tent. Not totally banished, as you see. <laughs> but our column and the tired Jewish people saw us. I'm with the name Pesach Bail. The tired Jewish people saw this. Come, Kalam, and they realized the greatness. Each person prostrated himself at the gentles of their own tent, the Shechina to the presence of God. The Lord spoke to Moshe Rabbeinu face to face. Like one person speaks to another person. Mishalav Amachne would always return to the camp. Mishalav and his attendant, Yeshua Ben Nun, not a lad, would never depart the tent. So Yeshua was always there. Upon him, upon him, face to face. Shabbat Amachla, after he spoke to Moshe, he returned to the camp to teach the elders. He would always, whenever he learned with God, he went right away to sit and learn in the base of Madish in the tent, in the camp. So Moshe conducted himself the way in Kip until the Mishkan was erected. But no more than that. For on the 17th of Thomas, the tablets are broken. On the 18th, he burned the calf and judged the sinners. On the 19th, he went up to Mount Sinai. Went back up the mountain, as it says, came to pass the next day, Moshe Rabbeinu said to the people, he spent 40 days on the mountain from the 19th day of Tammuz. 
to beg mercy. As he says later in Deuteronomy, I cast myself before the Lord. On the Shchidish Elo, it was said to him, in the morning I shall ascend Mount Zion to receive the second time. So this is now the third time. Came down before the Shchidish Elo. On the Shchidish Elo, he went up to the mountain. He remained upon the mountain just as the first day, 40 days. Just as the first day, the be the seventh day of Sivan to the seventh day of Thomas. I'm sorry, the seven days and seven Thomas. So the last days were goodwill. They reduced from this the intermediate ones that 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 intermediate ones were in the wrath. Seven on the, so the middle, so the three times he went up. First time for the seventh to the seventh day of Thomas. Next time for the 19th day to the to the till the beginning, till the end of of. of. Those are the days of wrath. Ultimately, those ultimately came the days of wrath for the seventh day, the, the three, the three weeks. The seventh day of time of day, the, 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 the broke into the walls of Yerushalayim, and the ninth of, of became. So those are known throughout history as the three weeks of mourning until today. We have three weeks of mourning, no weddings, no celebrations. These are the three weeks of mourning. All started, all started with the story of the golden calf. So this is, and ultimately, that's why Elul is called days of, days of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Rachamim, days of mercy, because the last 40 days from the Shchidosh Elul, from the beginning of the month of Elul, until Yud Tishrei, until the Yom Kippur is days of Racham in days where the Abishta is in the mode of forgiveness. He's just like he was in Moshe, in the mode of forgiveness. I am Hashem Salachti, God said, I forgive you. So to the month of Elul are days of forgiveness. Very special days in the Hebrew calendar in, 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 in throughout history. So on the 10th day of Tishrei, the Holy One blessed me. He said, Appeased to Israel joyfully and wholeheartedly, as he said to Moshe, I have forgiven as I have spoken. Salachti Kitvarach. On Yom Kippur, we say these, these, these two words many times. God said on Yom Kippur, okay, done. Salachti Kitvarach, I've forgiven, I'm done. So now the Abish had changed. That's why the Beis the Mishkan was, was built, and now the Abish Shechina was with the Jewish people again. So the whole thing was transformed from Rizchaydish Elul till the 10th day of Tishrei. And the Abish, and the way he says, the Abish did it with joy. He said, you're right, I forgive them. He gave them, he, he gave him a second tablet. He got, gave it over to him the second tablet, and he, Moshe Rabbeinu, descended, and God began commanding the, the work of the Mishkan. Everything was back on track from so all the previous conversation was all in the first, the middle 40 days. But God said, I'm going to send an angel. I don't want to get involved with you guys. I'm out of the picture. Best thing, I'm out of the picture. But then Moshe Rabbeinu went down another 40 days. He created a whole different scenario. And the Jews did tshuva, repented. And now we're back even greater than the first tablets. They constructed it until then. That's why they did it with such excitement. That's why what what uh, uh, Mishkan that should have taken a long time to build, they built it in less than two months. Because the Yidden were excited to reconnect to God that the Shechina would be in their midst. And that's why once the Shechina, once the tent was built, once the Mishkan was built, as the Torah says, then Moshe Rabbeinu's tent didn't become the oil. Now the oil merged, became in the middle of the Jews. Until then, until until the 10th day of, of, uh, of Tishrei, that his, his tent was out of the Machna, was out of the camp. Then the Mishkan was built and was in the middle of the camp. And that completes the Chumash of today. As I said, it's a long Pasha. We now go to the Tanya of the day. <laughs> now, al Rebbe continues, and he continues to explain how does a what does a what does a person should think think about real 
concept of, of how to break my ego. How does a person really need to think? Not that they do, yeah, oh, I'm nothing. No, he has, to know, he has to know what to think. Thus, to create terminology and talk negative about yourself is not true. You got to say what, what the thing is. I have an Nefesh of Bahamas. I have an animalistic soul. And that alone is terrible. I don't have to go to the terrible things. I got to go to the source of, te- of, of terrible things. Source of terrible things is my animalistic soul. And my animalistic soul is, is in me. It's part of me. Therefore, I have to realize I'm always carrying around something that is impure within me. As I'm carrying around a godly soul that's totally pure, at the same time, I'm not a tzaddik, so I'm carrying around in me an impurity. And I got to remember that. So I, so therefore, as great as I think I am, if I'm not a tzaddik, therefore, I am far from good because I'm carrying, even though I'm doing everything good, but I have this tumma in me. I have this impurity, this clipper. And therefore, the only way to make sure this kip, this clipper, this it's almost saying like a cancer, this cancer does not, I need to keep it down. The battle. If I just let it go, it's going to grow. And therefore, it's a continuous battle. To continue to keep this clipper, this animalistic soul down. And therefore, if you think about it, this is special, this is to men. The sins of the youth. It's a nice way to say. It's a nice way to the sins of the youth is a nice way to say. Um, um, uh, wasteful emissions. <laughs> Hormonal changes in men from their youth. And they had, they did a terrible sin. They've done terrible sins by wasteful emissions. Habagam Sha'asabiyam, you shouldn't think that this is just a natural phenomena. This is not a natural phenomenon. This is that you didn't that, that, that and your youth, you didn't control yourself. And uh, which brought about Khatas Nudim. Which brought about this concept, and it's not as this is not so posh it. because not only you did something that that whatever is not right thing to do, you wasted something that God gave you. You did a pagan yainim. You did a great blemish in the higher in the in in, in the heavens. Visham hula ma'ilam asman, and in heaven is above time and space, and therefore it doesn't make difference. Now you're 60, 80. When you did this when you were 15 years old or 16 years old, it's like you did it today. There's no time and space in heaven. So therefore, it's as you did it right now. If you did not do tshuva, then the sin is right there. That's what King David said. My sin is always in front of me. Oh, but I did it 10 years ago. Uh, If I didn't do tshuva, it's right now. Because it's not the sin that you did in this world. It's a sin that you have done in all worlds. At this you sinned and you and you purified yourself today. Maybe you did shuva. Maybe you did shuva. Uh, the ik, the most important kind of the shuva is in the heart. And you should know any shuva that you do, any shuva you do, Truth is in the heart, and there are many levels to the heart. Each person according to who he is. Well, if he has man, you can do the according to the person. The greater his stature, the higher level of plenty requires of him. And one and at one time and one place in which one stands as known to the known. That's why for a tzaddik to do tshuva is very hard. And that because God is very particular with tzaddikim. If you're a greater person, God's more particular with you. If you're not such a greater person, okay. What do you expect? As Meshach Abenu says to God, what do you expect for a nation that just came out of Egypt? 
and you've given them all this wealth, what do you expect? You actually brought them. That's how God forgives the Jews. You actually brought them. You, you, you enticed them. So, therefore, any time when he observes himself and sees that the light of the soul does not penetrate in him, it is evident that either today he repented, the repentance has not been accepted and his sin still separates him from God, or B, it is desired that he raise to a more sublime level of repentance coming from the point yet the deeper in his heart than even earlier. So therefore, any moment that I see that I am not, my soul is not within me, that means that my sins are blocking my soul. That means that this, that this dullness or this negativity is blocking my soul from, from, from flourishing. That alone is the proof that something is missing, right? When a person says, I don't feel it, so why don't feel it? Because something's blocking the feeling. When a person says, I'm indifferent, why are you indifferent? Because something is blocking the situation. You don't need to have a greater proof that something's blocking the situation than your feeling at the present time. That's why King David said, I just told you, King David says also, I'm in a struggle. Why? Because my sin is always in front of me. And therefore, Despite the fact that he was a tzaddik, who was able to say to himself, my heart is void within me, which means that Ashi comments that the evil impulse if, is as if dead within me. Despite this, he said, my sin is constantly before me. Why was it necessary for, for, for a man of David's caliber to constantly bear in mind a past sin? Surely he had repented for them adequately, obviously then, the memory of this is necessary in order to sp spur one on to greater heights. Why did David Amelah say, my sin is always before me? Because David Amelah said, my friends, to be, I need to keep on, on trucking. I need to keep on going higher. So how great I am, I need to be better. So I'm a tzaddik. So great, as long as I'm alive, I can always be a Russia. I, can always, I didn't lose my free choice. And therefore, what is going to motivate me? I'm going to remember what I've done. I'm going to remember that I, what I could do. I'm going to remember that this sin spurred me. That's why about tshuva should always remember that he did tshuva. Problem is, we do tshuva and then we become like regular guys. We become like part of the team. We become lazy. About tshuva should always be about tshuva. We should all be bali tshuva. We should remember what we did shuvah for so that it would inspire us just like we did shuvah in the past. We should continue to do shuvah. And for surely those that are not tzaddikim. So we need to remember and overcome these struggles every day. It's the time of the day. That was pretty quick. That completes the Tanya of the day, my friend. Today is the 13th day of the month, which is chapter 69, 70, and 71. 69, 70, and 71. I wish you all a great day. Learning chitas with you is the best. And God should bless you all with a wonderful, happy, and healthy day. And we'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. We'll continue the chitas of the day.